Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily, everybody. We are closely following a capital murder sentencing in Texas. A former Border Patrol agent could soon find himself on death row. A jury found Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles guilty of murder in Laredo, Texas last week. That immediately kicked off the penalty phase of the trial. Burgos Aviles was charged in 2018 with the deaths of his mistress, Griselda Hernandez, and their one and a half year old son, Dominic. Prosecutors argued that Dominic was born while the defendant was having an affair and Hernandez served him child support documents. Because of that, prosecutors say he stabbed Hernandez and the baby to death after meeting up with them near a park. Another week of evidence is expected as part of that penalty phase. The jury will then hand down a recommendation for either the death penalty or life in prison without parole. In court on Monday, Griselda's mom, who sometimes called her daughter Gray, testified about the effect these murders have had on her family, including Griselda's oldest son, Jaden, who was six when his mom was killed. <laughs> My whole world came apart. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Especially Dominic. <laughs> it's been very, very, very hard. <laughs> it has totally changed our lives. Do you and Jaden ever go into her room? Yes. Jaden asks, Grandma, can we go into Mom's room? That room is locked. She left. Everything is still the same the way she left it. But sometimes Jaden wants to go into her mom, her mom's room. So I go with him. He just wants to be there for a little while. He goes to his mom's bed. And he goes like this on her bed, just looking at the ceiling. I don't know what crosses his mind. But it has impacted him so much. Brian, let's talk about the defense for a second, because they're arguing that a cocktail of testosterone and prescription drugs led to psychosis. And his law enforcement background, that all of this should spare him being killed. Is that going to be winning an argument? Is that a winning argument? Do you think he'll actually be spared? I think it's the best argument they have. It's a creative argument. And, and I'll separate it into the two. The law enforcement one, great, throw it out there. But the question becomes, how good of an officer do you have to be to mitigate the fact that you stabbed the mother of your child and, an eight, and your 18-month-old child to death to avoid child support? You gotta be a really good law enforcement agent. I don't think that's enough here. The psychosis aspect is great, but don't forget, it's the same jury. For weeks, you've been saying it wasn't him, it wasn't him, it wasn't him. Then all of a sudden, you pivot and say, well, it's this cocktail of drugs. I don't think it's going to pass a laugh test I don't, or the sniff test or whatever test you want to call it. I think the jury's going to catch on and say, you know what, don't really buy it. Philip, yeah, he stabbed the mother of his child, this baby. He stabbed this baby to death. Is there really anything he could do to save himself? Because that feels really hard to get past for a jury. Remember, the test is whether or not the aggravators outweigh the mitigators. What do we have here? First of all, he has absolutely no criminal record, at least that I'm aware of. And usually the death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst. And obviously, if this is his only crime, he started off with a dilly. I understand that. But this was not committed, in my opinion, in his capacity as a law enforcement officer. Everybody seems to suggest, at least in social media, that because he's a cop who did this, he should die for it. But he did this in his capacity as a father yeah. with a mistress. And uh, I'm not sure that it's enough. He's entitled to a loss of human emotion to get life without parole. I can't say which way the jury is going to go, mm -hmm. but looking at the picture of his son, his baby son, that I feel is going to be really hard to get past. And welcome back, everybody. We are bringing you a brand new trial out of Phoenix, Arizona, involving defendant Michael Turney. The 75-year-old is charged in the murder of his stepdaughter almost 20 years after the crime. The story begins in May of 2001. 17-year-old Alyssa Turney was in her last day of junior year at Paradise Valley High School. She told her boyfriend that her stepfather, Michael Turney, was taking her out of school early and she was never seen again. 
attorney reported Alyssa missing to police saying she ran away. He told investigators that Alyssa left a note behind saying she was going to California. The case went cold until 2006 when a false confession brought it back into the spotlight. In 2008, it was determined by the missing persons unit that foul play was involved and sexual abuse allegations against Turney pointed authorities in his direction. Police searched Turney's home and found assault rifles, handmade silencers, gasoline cans, more than 20 pipe bombs, and a manifesto in which Turney accused his co-workers of killing Alyssa. Turney was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for illegal weapons possession and was released in 2017. In the following years, Alyssa's half-sister Sarah started a podcast and a TikTok account to bring awareness to the story. And in August of 2020, 19 years after Alyssa's disappearance, Turney was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. To this day, Alyssa's body has never been found. Monday marked the second day of his trial and the second day that Alyssa's half-sister Sarah testified for the prosecution. Here's some highlights from Monday's testimony. You recognize the, uh, this document? Yes. And what is it, please? That's the note that was on her dresser. The note that you found? Yes. Next to the cell phone? Yes. So let's just talk about the first line. When you dropped me off at school today, did you drop her off at school? No. I mean, she was gone when you got up, right? Correct. And this is addressed to Dad and Sarah, correct? Yes. Sarah, you said you didn't want me around. Look, you got it. Based upon the nature of your relationship with your sister at the time, does that make sense to you? No, there was no big fight or anything before we before she was gone. Did you want her out of your life forever? No. Why not? Because she took care of me. Have you on occasion asked your father uh, what happened to Alyssa? Many times. Has he ever given you an answer? He told me he'd tell me on his deathbed. And when did he make that statement? I met up with him at a Starbucks in October of 2017 to meet him face to face and finally get some answers. She was impulsive? At times. And she talked about leaving often, didn't she? No. You told Detective Anderson that she talked about leaving often? Yeah, that's probably how I felt at the time. No signs of a struggle? No. Didn't smell like any cleaning supplies had been recently used? Not that I recall. Didn't notice any blood in her room? No. So Brian Turney, he spent 10 years in federal prison for having the pipe bombs, the manifesto, claiming that he wanted to kill his colleagues, who, as I said, he believed were responsible for Alyssa's disappearance. Is any of that gonna come up in the case? Typically, I would say no, because the question becomes, what's the relevance? How, how does this pipe bomb and this gun and this manifesto and wanting to kill your coworkers connect to the alleged murder of your stepdaughter? But if I'm the defense attorney, I'm throwing it in there because you have to then believe that he went through this entire plan, getting all these ammunitions, all these guns. He willingly did 10 years in jail uh, instead of just saying, hey, guys, it's a hoax, whatever it is to try to throw the scent off of him, that's gotta be the craziest alternative plan. Hey, I'm gonna do 10 years in federal prison to try to throw the scent off of me for an actual murder that I committed. If you believe that, then maybe the defense can prevail. Well, Philip, police thought this case was a runaway case for seven years and the only arrest attorney 20 years later. That time, is that gonna hurt the prosecution's case? Not in this case at all, and I'll tell you why. First of all, this is a classic example of why murder does not have a statute of limitations. Initially, insufficient evidence is just that. They don't have probable cause or enough evidence to make an arrest. But sufficiency and evidence can develop over time. And let's see what they got. Do they have, for example, any DNA, any serological evidence, any other forensics? Do they have any digital evidence? Is there maybe even botanical evidence that could tie him to a homicide? Or may yeah. maybe there was some type of forfeiture by wrongdoing where he threatened her and right. it's going to come in through the sister. It's just pretty incredible that we're here and having a trial uh, of this case after so many years.